In 1993, seven hikers set out into a southern Siberian mountain range to hike and explore the beautiful wilderness. Unfortunately, somewhere deep in those mountains, something so horrifying and confusing would happen to them that it's still a mystery to this day. This is their story, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. Lyudmila Korovina was known as a master of survival craft, and at 41 years old, she'd spent decades teaching mountaineering to young students in Kazakhstan. She was known to push people to their limits, and sometimes beyond, to mold them into the best hikers they could be. But despite her reputation for being tough, her past students said she was as good a mentor as you can get, and many of them claimed to owe their lives to the skills she taught them. In 1993, an event known as the Turiata Tourism Festival was taking place, and people representing tourism and mountain sports from all over Russia and the surrounding countries gathered to camp, participate in competitions, and explore the Kamar Daban Mountains. During this festival, Lyudmila wanted to take a group of her favorite students to do something special and a little more challenging than usual. The Kamar Daban Mountains are a small chain that form part of Russia's South Siberian Mountains, and they sit near the border with Mongolia near the city of Irkutsk. They stretch 350 kilometers from east to west and are thought to be the oldest mountain range in the world. They aren't the highest by any measure and peak at just under 2,400 meters or 8,000 feet, but they're still challenging and beautiful and with a railroad that provides easy access, they're a popular destination for both tourists and mountaineers. In the summer, they can get quite humid and temperatures hang around 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 to 18 Celsius. It also often rains heavily as thunderstorms roll in from the Mongolian plateau. But again, despite the dampness, they're considered a safe destination to go hiking and an ideal spot for young hikers to explore the wilderness. The route the group had planned, though, wasn't one for the average tourist. Generally, trekking has three or four levels of difficulty, depending on where you are. Russia used a four-grade system at the time, starting with easy for beginners, moving up to moderate, where you walk up small hills for up to four hours or so per day, on to strenuous, where you spend much of the day climbing higher peaks, and then very strenuous or challenging, which sometimes uses no trail at all, and hikers will often travel along high ridges and over mountains from dawn to dusk. And how a route is graded comes down not only to how high you go and how long you'll be walking, but also how many skills you'll need, like knowing how to rock climb or navigate in the wilderness. They're also graded on how physically and mentally fit you have to be to complete the route, and the route Ludmila and the group had chosen was a grade 4, which is the highest difficulty. Knowing this would be the most difficult track they'd ever done, they spent months leading up to it preparing and training, and over the course of that time, Ludmila's tough love shaped them into both competent mountaineers and close friends. Finally, on August 2nd, the full group met up to catch the train to Irkutsk. In addition to Ludmila, there was Valentina, who generally went by the name Valia. Valia was 17 and had been walking the hills all her life and was known for being calm and collected in tough situations. Joining them was also 23-year-old Sasha. He and Ludmila were close and she had known him since he was just a kid and often described him as being like a son to her. Sasha was also exceptionally fit and very experienced at this sort of challenging hike. He would act as almost a second coach next to Ludmila. There was also 19-year-old Dennis who was sort of an accidental member of the group. He only got his place in the trip when someone else dropped out because their parents wouldn't let them go. He was so excited to be part of the group that all he left was a short note for his parents that he was going to the mountains and he would be back soon before leaving the house. Then there was also 24-year-old Tatiana who loved walking the mountains but had never attempted anything beyond a moderate grade 2. This was a chance for her to prove what she was made of and after all the training they'd done, she felt like she was ready to handle anything. Next was Tumur who was the youngest in the group at just 15. He was essentially born to trek though and grew up in the mountains and hiking with his parents basically as soon as he was old enough to walk. And then finally, there was 16-year-old Victoria. She wasn't a natural mountaineer, but desperately wanted to be a part of the trip. At first, the others weren't happy about this because she'd had a temper tantrum on a winter hike earlier that year after getting tired. She wouldn't have even been there at all if her mother hadn't called Ludmila and begged her to take her along. But later, during training, she worked hard and regained the trust and friendship of the rest of the group. After meeting up, they started their journey by train from their home in Kazakhstan to Irkutsk. From there, they went to Marino, which is a town at the foot of the range and the perfect spot to set off from. On the way, they were joined by a couple of guys from Moscow, heading to the area to relax and fish by the Sniaznia River. Then, after arriving in Marino, the plan was to walk until August 5th and eventually meet up with another group led by Ludmila's daughter, Natalia. Both groups checked the weather forecasts and things were looking good with above-average temperatures and just a little rain forecasted over the next four days. 
The first two days went well, and the group took a slightly more unusual route than most, but in doing so, cut off a bunch of time that helped them summit several of the highest peaks ahead of schedule. They walked around 70 kilometers and crossed the Langutai Gorge, then across high plateaus over several rivers, and then up the highest in the Kamar Daban range, known as Kanulu. Then on the third day, a cyclone coming up from Mongolia took the region by surprise and caused a day of rain that left the center of Irkutsk flooding up to people's knees. That same rain fell hard in the mountains, and at higher elevations, this turned to heavy snow, and the group was walking along a high ridge when the skies opened up and the snow and rain came pouring down. Initially, they decided to press on as far as they could, worried they might miss their rendezvous with the other party. But then as they trudged down the mountain, soaking wet in the pouring rain and wind, realized it was too exhausting to continue. So at about 4pm, they decided that instead of heading through the forest to the planned camping spot, they'd set up camp in the open and get some rest. This really wasn't a great spot to camp because it was an exposed and windy patch between two mountains with just some rocks and grass for shelter. The ideal location under the tree line was another 4 kilometers away, but that was just too far to drag themselves and their drenched bags in the ice cold rain. They obviously couldn't build a fire either, but that didn't dampen the mood. While the rain continued to come down, they did their best to enjoy the night, huddling in the two driest tents while talking about what they'd achieved on the hike so far. For some reason, maybe because they didn't want to get them wet on the inside, they never got into their sleeping bags. They didn't even take them out of the plastic wrap and instead just fell asleep exhausted on the floor of their tents on plastic ground sheets. Unfortunately, that night wasn't much better and sleep would be short-lived. At 4am, the ropes to the tent snapped and they had to go outside to fix them. Not long after they'd done that, the wind tore the stake holding the tents down. Then, finally, after a wet and cold night, they woke up to snow covering most of the area. As they got up and cooked breakfast, they found that the snow had covered basically all the landmarks in the day before. After breakfast, at around 11.30, they set off toward the trees, hoping that tree cover would provide some shelter and help them to get their bearings. With any luck, they'd meet the other group ahead of time as they planned the night before. Unfortunately, this is where things took an almost unbelievable turn. According to Valia, just 10 meters into their trek down the hill, Sasha just fell over. They helped him to his feet, but he fell again, and this time he let out a piercing scream. Lyudmila told the rest of the group to keep moving while she returned to help, but in the meantime, inexplicably, Sasha was foaming at the mouth while blood started pouring from his eyes and ears. After falling to the ground a second time, he started violently convulsing, and then by the time Lyudmila could reach him, he'd already stopped moving. Upon seeing Sasha collapse, she cried out for the others to get help as she began trying to revive him, but basically as soon as they started moving again, Lyudmila also screamed out for help. Valia quickly covered the others and then told them to wait where they were and then ran back to Lyudmila and Sasha. In some accounts, Valia claims Lyudmila died the same way as Sasha, but in others, she claims that she'd had a heart attack. Either way, to Valia and the others' shock, Lyudmila passed out and collapsed on top of Sasha. Tatiana, Victoria, and Tamura then climbed out from underneath their covering and rushed back to them, but almost immediately, Tatiana started grasping for air too and grabbing at her throat as if she was trying to force her airway open. Then, to everyone's horror, she ran to a nearby boulder and began hitting her head against it over and over until she finally went limp and slumped to the ground. Terrified and having just witnessed the horrific scene, Valia froze and dropped to the ground as well. Dennis, also horrified at what he was witnessing, crouched down and hid behind an outcropping of rocks while trying to get inside his sleeping bags, hoping it could protect him from whatever was happening to the others. Finally, Valia snapped out of it and composed herself and crawled over to Ludmila and found that she wasn't breathing. Then she went back to Tamura, who was by then completely hysterical and lifted him onto his feet and told him to head for the trees. Next, she took Victoria by the arm and began pushing her out in front of her toward the forest, but Victoria went into a frenzy and started violently pulling away from Valia. Eventually, she even bit Valia's hand, which caused her to let go and then ran off toward the forest after Tamur. But unfortunately, they also didn't manage to get far before they both began to cough up blood and started clawing at their throats just like Tatiana. Valia then watched as they started tearing off their clothes as if they were boiling up inside before they both collapsed the ground. Dennis, who up until then hadn't been overcome by whatever was happening to the others, shouted to Valia to dump all the essentials from her backpack. He then took off for the woods as she began emptying her bag, but almost as soon as he broke cover from the boulder, he began to choke like the others, bleeding from his face and his body seizing as he fell to the ground. Valia then looked around and saw that every single one of her friends was on the ground and not moving, and her normal calm turned into a massive adrenaline surge, so she got up and sprinted and sprinted, and she kept running until she was deep inside the woods. Finally, she couldn't run anymore, and she was far enough inside the forest and away from the wind. In the calm that follows panic, Valia tried to compose herself again, but supposedly by then, the storm had become so strong that trees were falling like matches around her. 
She eventually spotted a crack in a cliffside and just wedged herself inside it to hide until the storm died down. While waiting, she thought about her family and she worried about what might happen to her mother if she didn't return home. At the same time, she thought about everything she'd just seen and tried to make sense of it. It was like a literal nightmare that she couldn't wake up from. A little while later, after the storm had calmed down a bit and she had calmed down a little bit, she found what seemed like a safe spot and set up camp. She realized that thanks to Dennis, she still had her pack and some essentials, which thankfully included a tent, a plastic ground sheet, and some clothing. Finally, after setting everything up, she climbed inside her sleeping bag, threw her tent over her for extra warmth, and then completely wiped out, fell into a deep sleep. The following day, she woke up cold and hungry and realized that a tent and a change of clothes weren't enough to keep her alive for long. She had no choice but to go back the way she came to see if she could find supplies in the bodies of the rest of the group, which also meant potentially encountering whatever it was that had caused everything from the day before. When she reached them, she cautiously approached and found that they were still where they had fallen. Then after finding a map and some food from their packs, she had an even worse realization. She had no idea where she was. She had a map now, but the snow cover still made it impossible to spot landmarks. Instead, the best she could do was follow the tree line until she found something that she recognized on the map, so off she went down toward the forest again. Several hours later, after walking across the mountain essentially all day, she spotted an abandoned electricity relay tower in the distance. With this new sign of civilization, she set off once again and eventually reached it by nightfall. It seemed like as good a spot as any to set up camp, and as she did, she wondered if anyone had alerted search and rescue after they missed their rendezvous. It seemed inevitable that soon enough, search and rescue would be scouring the area looking for them. Unfortunately, no help was coming. When Lyudmila's group didn't show up at the meeting point, Natalia and the other team weren't worried. She knew they were strong hikers, that her mother was a master, and there'd be nothing to worry about. She assumed the rain had just slowed them down and she'd see them all when they got home. In the morning and in the light of day, Valia noticed that the tower she'd slept under was just one of a chain heading down the mountain. She guessed that if she followed them down the hill, they'd lead to somewhere she could find help. The route was difficult and the forest overgrowth slowed her progress, but she eventually reached the end and found a small abandoned village that was once supplied by the electricity cables she followed. It was disappointing that no one was there, but then just beyond the houses was a major river. Since the tourism festival was taking place in the area, and part of that was kayaking, canoeing, and fishing, she thought she could use the river to find a route or at least signal for help. By then, it was late again, so Valia spent another night at the waterside before heading down to the bank to see if anyone would pass by. The following day was a much warmer day and the heat began to take its toll on her already exhausted body. After walking for another several kilometers, she remembered that in training she'd been shown how to use a sleeping bag to let rescue parties know where you are, so she draped hers over a bush by the river and then rested and waited hoping to be spotted. Not far from where she was, a kayaker named Alexander was taking a small group of fellow Ukrainians down the Sneznia River. It had been a relaxing day and the thin curtain of snow that lined the banks made the era even more picturesque than usual. The tourism festival made it quite a busy river, with people paddling and fishing down the shore. On his way up, they'd passed a couple of fishermen from Moscow and waved hello. They waved back, as was the custom, as the group dipped their paddles into the clear waters and continued on their way. As they floated along, they spotted a sleeping bag by the riverside as they reached a bend. Stood next to it was the motionless, expressionless Valia. Assuming she was just another person out fishing on the bank, they shouted a greeting at her, but didn't get a response. Valia didn't even move a muscle. Right away, something wasn't quite right about the girl, making them uneasy as they continued down the river. And although they didn't want to, soon enough they knew they had to turn back. It's here that the story begins to break up a bit. Some reports say that Valley was covered in blood and became inconsolable when kayakers approached, but according to the kayakers, there was no blood. One of the kayakers also claims that she looked like she'd recently washed her hair and face in the river. When they got to her and asked what happened, she didn't say a word because she was too shocked and traumatized to speak. Instead, she buried her head into Alexander's chest and sobbed. The kayakers then wrapped her in a blanket to warm her up and dug out some antibiotics and other medicine to give her in case she had an infection. After she was bundled up, they all headed back down the river together, and before long they bumped the same fishermen they had met earlier and Valia instantly recognized them. They were the fishermen from Moscow she'd met on the train. Upon seeing her, they smiled and waved and asked how the others were getting along. This is probably when Valia broke down and talked, although it's not entirely clear. In a garbled frenzy, she told them what had happened. She told them about the screams and the blood. She told them about the cold and the panic. She told them how the two youngest had run away only to fall to the ground and how Tatiana smashed her head against the rock. And obviously, after hearing this, her new friends were horrified and confused. None of what she said made sense. They decided to look after her from then on and helped her back out of the wilderness to let police know something had happened to the rest of her party. 
They even arranged for her train ticket back home once it was all over. It took a few days before Valia could tell the story in a way that anyone could understand. But once it was clear that something had happened to the others, the police commissioned a helicopter to go and search for them. The weather and other factors made it impossible for them to get off the ground until August 21st, nearly two weeks after the incident. And as it happened, they weren't the only people missing in the region. Two other hikers had been reported missing on August 17th. After five days of searching, they spotted the pair who, like Valia, had found a good spot to wait for rescue and covered a bush with their sleeping mats so they could be spotted. Then, right after the helicopter took off with the pair on board, they spotted the missing party, and it wasn't a pretty sight. The bodies of the group were found on a small ledge and some were huddled together while others were some distance away. During those few weeks, the bodies had begun to swell up while insects, animals, and normal decomposition had started to destroy what was left. Many of the battle-hardened recovery team threw up at the sight of them. To make the scene even more horrific, everyone in the group seemed to have removed most of their clothing, with most of them wearing only thin tights. Three of them were barefoot, apart from the two youngsters who tore at their clothes, which Valia hadn't mentioned in her story. The bodies were eventually wrapped in plastic and flown to a nearby city for autopsy, and weirdly, the autopsy found that they had all died from hypothermia except for Lyudmila, who had died of a heart attack. They also had bruising in their lungs, suggesting some issues with their breathing, and even more strangely, they were all on the brink of starving and were found to have critically low protein levels. So what caused these deaths is still a mystery. There are a few ideas, some more likely than others, but they all have problems. One idea is that they accidentally witnessed a military experiment and were murdered to keep them quiet, and then their deaths were covered up by the authorities, which is why Valia's story doesn't match what was found in the autopsy. After all, they had strayed from the usual route, and who knows what was going on in the early years of post-Soviet Russia. This doesn't explain how Valia survived, however. On top of that, as far as we know, no one tried to shut her up after she told her story. After the incident, Valia studied at college and left Kazakhstan for a new life, and now with a family, she's only once spoken about the incident and swears she never will again. She claims that she just doesn't want to relive the nightmare. At the same time, she's never retracted her original story. If she had been coerced into keeping quiet, why would she tell everyone a story that only makes things more mysterious? Why not just say they froze to death because they weren't ready for such a big storm and she was the lone survivor? And that's another problem with the secret government operation idea. It's a popular area where a lot of people go hiking, and it was even more popular at the time because of the tourism festival. It seems unlikely that a secret government project would use that spot when the mountains just a few hundred miles away are much more remote. So if it wasn't a government murder and cover-up, could the government have killed them accidentally? Russia has been known to use nerve agents in the past, and it even has a class of poisonous gases that fit the symptoms that Valia described. They were developed around 1993, and some reports claim they were tested in the Kamar Daban region. This type of nerve agent was even famously used to assassinate a Russian double agent and his daughter in Salisbury, England in 2018. And if it was this nerve agent, some people think the rain might have had something to do with it. These poisons can dissolve in the water and hang around for long periods of time. And if they were testing the poison in the mountains in the weeks or months before the trip, the excess toxin could have been washed down in the heavy rain. At some point that morning, Sasha might have accidentally stepped into a pool of that poison. Then, after stepping in it, when Ludmila rushed over to help him, she was poisoned as well, followed by Tatiana, Victoria, and Tamur, and finally Dennis, who by crouching on the ground also became contaminated by poisoned groundwater. This theory could also explain why the police waited so long to begin their search. They might have needed to make sure the area was clear. However, again, it doesn't explain how Valia survived. She got to the first two victims before anyone else and touched the arm of someone who could have been contaminated. That should have been enough to kill her. On top of all of that, it would have just been the worst luck for those chemicals to have seeped into the ground just at the right time and in the right amount to contaminate a single hiker who then killed everyone else, all while never infecting anyone else any time that year. So another theory is that if they were poisoned, it didn't necessarily have to be a military nerve agent that made them sick. Maybe it was just their drinking water that was poisoned. High in the Kamar Daban Mountains is Lake Baikal. As well as being a tourist attraction for its beautiful landscapes and popular trails, it's also where tens of thousands of tons of toxic waste have been dumped. A pulp and paper mill has been dumping chlorine and other nasty chemicals into lakes since 1966, and excrement and fuel have also been pumped in at least that long. One idea is that the group had been topping up their water in the rivers downstream of Lake Baikal that morning, and they were hit by something like chlorine poisoning. But then again, how did Valia survive when no one else did, and why did it only happen to this one group? You'd expect more reports of people becoming sick after topping up their water bottles in local streams, especially given how big the lake is and how close it is to some big towns and villages. But there are just no other reports, so if it wasn't nerve gas or something they drank, maybe they hadn't been poisoned at all. Maybe Valia was simply mistaken. Another theory is that the account that Valia told was simply her mind trying to cope with trauma. 
Human brains don't remember things perfectly. That's because the job of memory isn't to keep a perfect record of what we've done. Memory keeps hold of any information that our brains think might be useful in the future, bits and pieces that might one day help keep us alive. Some psychologists believe that's why people who nearly drown say they see their whole life flash before them. It's your brain's way of trying to find something from your life that can help you get out of the situation. At the same time, our brains also twist and distort our memories to help us make better sense of things, especially when things are traumatic. The group might have died of hypothermia as they camped out, exposed, wet, hungry, and without a fire to warm them. Valia might have survived because she was fitter than the others, had warmer clothes, was sleeping in a slightly warmer spot, or was just lucky. Then when she woke up, she would have found her friends dead or dying, some of them without their clothes due to paradoxical undressing, and then she could have panicked and run. When asked, all Valia will say was that the cold rain was the cause of what happened and that Ludmila isn't to blame. But maybe she was, and Valia couldn't cope with that. As a survival mechanism, maybe her brain ignored her instructor's bad choices and it gave her a false memory of what happened. It wasn't just a poorly planned hike gone wrong, but some terrible, mysterious sickness that passed from one to the other. The chief specialist of the area's rescue service thinks that this is the most likely explanation. He puts it down to mass psychosis caused by hypothermia and exhaustion. However, even he pointed out that others survived heavy snow at the same time the group was out, so why not them? He thinks that this might simply have been because they weren't prepared for the storm, but at the same time, they'd spent months getting ready with a known master mountaineer with a reputation for excellence, so could that be true? They were supposed to be prepared for anything, and it doesn't explain how Valia's training was good enough to keep her alive, but not the others. So, with Valia refusing to open up about what happened, and so many problems with each of the proposed theories, the Kamar de Bon disaster might always remain a mystery. In any case, I'm curious to hear what all of you think happened, so let me know down in the comments which explanation you think is most likely. If you enjoyed this video, this is part of a series, so you might want to check out the other videos in the series. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to send it to the email found in the description. We also have a scary interesting Discord, which I will also link in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.